Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another episode of Porn Star Confessions. Today I've got the legendary Skywood. Welcome. Thank you. It's my honor to be on your show, sir. So you're like one of the OGs, really. So, I mean, first of all, I guess the first question would be, how did you get started in all this, like, originally? Um, I started doing porn, you could say back in the Big Muscle days, you know, that website, Big Muscle. I started posting photos on that, and I just liked the response I got. I'm like, huh, you know, I'd like to take this to another level, you know, so... And, and just as I thought that, I got contacted by a site called bluelife.com. It's a guy who did basically butts, you know, it's all butts, you know, all about the butt. So I did that, and, and I think that's how uh, Colt discovered me. I got a message from Manfred Spear, who was the director and the, the, the scout for Colt back then. Scouting models. I got a message from him, and you know, I started doing videos with Colt. That was back in 2005. But Blue Life was 2004, okay. so uh, that was basically how I got my start in this. Um, we could go further back to my childhood and say, you know, how I used to stick cucumbers up my ass and how I used to get off on weird shit like that, you know. But <laughs> I don't know. So what? What were you doing? for work at the time when you first started posting pics on that site? I was a massage therapist, and I have been for probably 30 years now. Uh, I was doing oh, massage, shit. I was doing a little personal training. And uh, I actually had a couple of warehouse jobs even, you know, where I was driving a forklift, so. Uh -huh. So what inspired you to first post those pics online? You know, I, I wanted to be seen. I wanted to show my body off. I wanted to just show what I had. You know, it was arousing to me to show my body to other men. So I, uh, that's the main reason. It was just fueling my curiosity to see what it's like to make so many people sexually excited, I guess. But, um, at the time, I, I was doing it just to show off for the camera and doing it just to, for them. But now I have a, I can express myself from within rather than trying to show off just for the camera. It's going to be different this time. What do you mean? Um, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, it's kind of hard to explain, but I feel like all those years I did porn in the old days, I was doing it for the, just for the camera and for other people. I wasn't coming from a place within inside of myself oh. and I wasn't fully expressing myself. So I feel like I've reached that point now and that's part of the reason why I want to come back and do it again, but do it okay. in a way that I can just fully express myself you know, and really enjoy it and get off on it. You know, that's no. Oh. So how old are you now? 52. Okay, they look damn good, Jesus. Yeah, and 50 is like the new 40. I don't think that's that old at all. I don't feel 52, you know. I, I feel like I look better and uh, I'm healthy, you know, than I have been in many years. So, you know, I don't think it's all about age. I think it's about how good you look and how good you feel in your own skin. Yeah. Uh, so age is so, not really an issue for me. I don't I don't mind telling anyone my age. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Well, plus the whole daddy thing is super in right now. It is. That, it really is. It so, really is. Uh, it's amazing. You know, you see all these older guys doing porn, and it's hot to watch. And uh, yeah, it's a whole thing now. Daddy, the daddy trend. So, one question, because you talked about how you're doing it for the camera at the beginning and your reasons changed. So, kind of along those same lines, how did you get into bodybuilding? Because your physique is nothing short of impressive. Well, thank you. How did I get into bodybuilding? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
when I was 10, I saw uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, doing Conan, the, you know, Conan the Barbarian. You know, I saw that movie and I'm like, I was just fascinated with the, the body and the muscles. And that's what opened it up. I'm like, okay. I, and I started, I got my own weight set down in the basement, you know, before school every morning. I'd go down and work out in my little weight set. And then I joined the local gym, which was like a help spa kind of place. You know? and, uh, so, you know, I started at a young age, 10 years old. By the time I was 15, I looked more mature than most 15 year olds. I, my body, all natural too. I didn't really get into doing steroids until you know, later on, until I was in my early 20s. And then my body just went to a whole other level. Of course, I don't do that anymore. I stopped that a while back. You know, I feel much better. Steroids. I don't suggest anyone doing them. They're not healthy, <laughs> especially if you're not moderating and checking your your blood and you know your liver and stuff like that. But um, yeah. anyway, Schwarzenegger was my idol. Of course, I got to throw Sylvester Stallone in there. He was another idol. So they were sort of like idols of mine to look a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm thinking. I would wager that probably 70% of the men like around our age got into bodybuilding because of Arnold. Yeah, I would think so. I I wouldn't doubt that at all. Yeah, I mean, he was my inspiration. I mean, I was just like, yes, that's what I want to be. Yeah. Yeah, he was... So. Okay. So I'm guessing that's going to be a part of your life for the rest of your life. Of course, yeah. It uh, takes front, center stage in you know, my life uh, most of the time. You know, uh, always thinking of my health. Uh, the body is a miraculous machine, you know. Uh, it's, it's great to see that I can continue to get better as I get older and feel better. And to see the changes and feel the changes. That's all fascinating to me, but yeah, I can. I'm going to do this until the day I roll over and not get back up, you know. Or as they say, wake up dead. <laughs> wake up dead. I like that. So okay, and one thing because the people who are watching can't see, um, but your butt is like really what you're known for. It is, and even back in so, those days. You know, but now really? my butt is amplified, you could say, in size. Uh, and I think that's all part of this whole sexual awakening. You know, it just sort of started growing, you know, when all this come about. Isn't that strange? But, uh, yeah. So I'm gu- guessing most of your butt is just really good genetics? Most of it, yeah. Okay. It's a secret recipe, you know. I won't share it, but... It's just a combination of certain things that I do and have been doing for the last several years that have really been paying off, obviously, to make it bigger. Because it just continues to grow. It's like an alien back there, you know? It's like I don't even recognize it anymore, you know, because it just keeps growing. And all I'm doing is the basic things. Like I said, this certain exercises, massaging. I cup a lot, but I'm not going to share all my recipe but that's just some of the things a cupping it does amazing things you put cups on the butt stimulate okay yeah go ahead i was just gonna say that the cupping really stimulates circulation and blood flow and it loosens up the fascial layers which allows the muscles to fill out more you know what i mean uh hmm. so i, I always w- wondered what that is because i'll see dudes all the time the with circle. like those yeah, yeah, yeah. On like their shoulders, their back, their chest. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I know. I, I used to think that when I before I knew about it, but now in, I know about this. It's an ancient practice, been around two thousand years, and it really it unblocks energy blocks. You know, it opens up your chi and your body too. It not only like creates better circulation, but the the energetic stuff I get out of it's just amazing. I feel. I feel good, you know, when I do it, I feel so good. So I would recommend it to anyone wanting to get a bigger butt or bigger tits. I mean, do it here too. It makes these a little more full. Okay. All right. Remind me to ask you about that after the interview because I'm super curious. So 
you're posting pictures on this website. Somebody notices you. They take some more pics, and then Colt reaches out to you. Did you ever consider doing porn before that? Um, honestly, I think from a, a young age, I started fantasizing about certain things, you know, like being gangbanged by a bunch of black men in a prison. But I would like for there to have been a camera there so that everyone could watch. I mean, yeah, at a young age. So, <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Um, but... Okay, so the question about that, because a lot of people have, uh, like, I call it the sex demon. So the sex demons, when you're in that, like, really horny headspace, and you're like, oh, my God, I'd love to do this and this and this. And then you come, and you get that post-nut clarity. And you're like, what the fuck was I thinking? I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Especially, like, yeah. So... <laughs> So, but I, I feel like for a lot of people, a lot of stuff stays in that sex demon box and doesn't transfer over to reality. Yeah. But it sounds like that was different for you. Yeah, uh, it, it uh, I guess you could say it was different for me. <laughs> so, uh, but honestly, I, I feel like I was holding back all those years, you know, I really wasn't expressing myself fully you know, on camera with doing all the porn I did. I wasn't really enjoying it, you know, and I wasn't getting off on it like I feel like I could have. So I really want to experience my sex demon now, you know, to the fullest that's in there. Wow. You know? yeah. But with clarity, so of course, all the time, not just why I'm horny, you know, and then I get off and I'm like, okay. So, so what held you back the first time around? I can honestly say, I think it, now that I'm learning a little more about myself as a human person, uh, a lot of that was just childhood traumas, you know, basic childhood traumas that I had no idea were traumas. They were limiting my ability to see things as they really are. So uh, I went into porn with that sort of blockage there. Uh, now that blockage has been removed. I know more about myself. I've learned more about myself. I feel like I can fully express myself now. And I plan on doing it, you know, it's, uh, and having fun and real, I really, and I also can say like my body's more sensitive as I've gotten older, my nipples, my ass, everything is like, oh my God, dude, do you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you just get, yeah. there's different sensations as you, I, I think it's also a skill that you develop with your mind as you get older, you develop the ability to pleasure yourself more and, and feel it more because you're more inside yourself and you, and you understand yourself better. So that's, that's part of it, I think. Uh, so I'm really excited about showing these skills off in a, in a sort of a gangbang sort of thing. That's one thing I never did back in the days and I want to do it now. Of course, I still only practice safe sex. I don't do anything without condoms. I go old school because it's protected me all these years and I've never really caught anything from anyone. As a result of that, so. Wait, what? You never once have caught anything? Nope, not that I know of. I mean. Uh, oh, you would know, trust me. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's why I'm like, I'm actually surprised too, because, you know, I did escorting for a long time. I started escorting when I was 18, just doing escorting. So that, that's when I first started experiencing, you know, other men in weird kind of ways or whatever. But but I, I started off playing safe. And, uh, the condom broke once when this guy was fucking me. And man, did I freak out. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, this is back in the 90s. 
So I thought, am I going to have AIDS you know, or whatever? And so I realized then that I cannot test myself by allowing people to, to, you know, to have sex with people without protection, you know, because it just eats away at my mind. It's like, I don't like that. You know, I like to feel comfortable. Uh, so I, I learned to set that boundary. But there are still in my life, you know, there were, to go back to your question about what was holding me back, you know, back then, I didn't know how to set boundaries for myself mentally, so I was just doing it to please everyone. I was doing certain things to please other people without even considering myself, you know, being a part of that pleasure, if that makes any sense. Yeah, mostly. So, like, when you were shooting porn back in the day, did you feel like you were completely doing it for the viewer and your needs and wants were irrelevant like that? The only thing I was fulfilling was being seen. I just wanted people to see me, you know, and there's this whole, there's a lot of different levels to that, what I'm talking about, but just being seen, you know, is really, you know, you get on camera and you, you do your thing and people see you. That was basically all I was doing it for. Uh, I feel like there's so much more to it than that. You know what I mean? When you're, the thing is, is in chemistry with other people and models, it's the bread and butter. You know, it's how you make real magic. It's how you can fully express your own self is with someone who you share good chemistry with too. But I didn't know how to tap into any of that back then. It's just sort of just going along with the script and, you know, just I had the body. You could say I was all body and no mind. Now I'm mind and body. Or I wouldn't say I'm more mind than body, but I'm sort of like more mind than than I am body. (laughs) Okay, I have a, a question. And for those of you watching, I'm sure most of you guys can understand. There is a difference, big difference between fucking and getting fucked. Like, big fucking difference. So, my question for you is the the state, if you will, the state that you were in back then, how were you getting fucked? Because that would, like, my ass would have, there ain't, hell no. <laughs> like I said to you, as a kid, I got an early start on that with uh, various fruits and vegetables, sticking cucumbers up my ass and stuff. You know, I started playing around with it, and but I'd be honest, I never really stretched my pucker hole out that much. You know, it's still really tight, resilient, believe it or not. So I'd never get into fisting and all that stuff. But anyway, yeah, it just always felt good to me, and I knew. I was a bottom, you know, when I learned about top and bottom, I'm like, yeah, I must be a bottom, you know, because I didn't really want to fuck anybody, you know, except, you know, I fucked girls for a while, and I fucked a few guys, but, and I wasn't really into it, you know, I'm more into getting, being on the receiving end, obviously, and nowadays, I can literally come without touching my dick, you know, it's like, I get really sexually stimulated, anally, easily. Whereas before, you know, I'll be honest, when I was getting fucked, you know, on the camera for a cold, it was, it was hard work to get off. It's like, you know, at the end, you know, when you had to do the cum shots, like, it was like almost impossible sometimes, you know, maybe it was the pressure, I don't know, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, but now that, that's not an issue, because I'm really experiencing pleasure in a different way, I guess. Uh, so, I think that's just going to make this a little more fun for me. Just doing some scenes and really enjoying it and expressing it. And the body is and porn are both like vessels that we can express ourselves through, you know, sexually, spiritually, yeah. emotionally. So I have a question about the condom thing. Like, I understand, you know, back the first time around when you were doing it, the condoms were the norm. And bareback was insanely taboo. So I get that. And, but, you know, now with like 
crap and doxy pep and all that yeah. stuff. You know, on on one hand, I could argue there's all this medication to protect against it, but on the other hand, I I can see it from the point of view of you know it's kind of like a a, a great grandmother who grew up during the depression and still like stocks food you know because that never quite really leaves is it like that for you i'm i'm considering you know i'm also learning like these days you know cream pie stuff is very popular and and guys love to see guys get fucked bareback so there are lots all these tools out there now that really protect you know so i'm considering and it would be with some guys that i trusted and knew and saw their paperwork and saw they were clean and stuff and I may consider it. So yeah, I think that after all these years, yeah, I may uh, consider doing bareback eventually. But because a lot of guys ask me that, and I'm like, no, oh, I just use condoms. And so um, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of stuff out there now. I mean, it's different nowadays than it was back in the back in the day, you know. So all these different tools, you know, that you can just take after having sex, you know cleans up anything, you know, right? STDs, HIV, all this stuff, so, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I'm, I'm curious about, and I think you are, uh, especially qualified to speak on it is a lot of people don't understand what life is like after porn, you know, cause they're, still in it whatnot so for you having been you know your sky woods right what made you walk away from it originally and then what was life like after that very good question um this is going to be the real answer the reason i i really walked away from it was i have a daughter she's now 21 years old but she you know she was curious she discovered me very young age and she saw my porn you know, at a young age and then she's like daddy will you please stop doing porn i said okay yes so i i stopped and that was back in 2012. so but now she's older and she she is ex more accepting and uh, she's okay with it so that was basically one of the things that held me back. But you know what? I'm glad I got that break. You know? I'm glad I stopped. You know? It allowed me to have different perspective on everything and, you know, uh, to learn more about myself, more self-discovery. Now here I am back and I'm ready to jump back in and with a whole different mindset and different perspective. We'll see what happens. <laughs> oh. Did porn negatively, like, after you decided to walk away, did, were there any positive or negative effects of doing porn, like, after the fact? Not really. Not for me. Uh, because, like I said, I wasn't really that mentally connected to it in the first place. It was just more of a body thing. So, um uh, I know I actually for years I, I would people would see me out in person and I just really enjoyed the attention. I enjoyed the fact they wanted my autograph and uh, they recognized me. I'm like, wow, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, so, no, I never really had any serious negative, you know, unfortunately, there are guys like, you know, Eric Rhodes and some of the others that took their own lives, you know, that different story for them. You know, so I'm really glad that I uh, had a whole different mindset and that I wasn't so tied into it that it was all of me and everything, you know, like some guys, it's like that's their everything, you know, and, and that's what they depend on to exist and to feel appreciated, I guess. And, and as some of these guys get older, they can't let go of that. And, you know, it's sad, some of them. For me, uh, no, no really negative side effects or anything, you know, nothing negative come out of it. Um, 
just just a lot of different perspective and I you know looking back now I didn't do it for the money I just sort of jumped in and did I was a country bumpkin I had no brains I wasn't thinking and I had the body and I just wanted to show off and want people to see me and that was all I did it for but it is about the money and it is about showing off and expressing myself. it's about all of it now so now I'm going to go in there with that mindset you know, a different mindset on it so uh, I'll do it for as long as I can. So it really, I, I think I never thought about it like that until you mentioned it, but you're absolutely right that there is a big difference between someone who, who porn becomes their entire identity. Whereas you, it sounds like porn was just something you did it wasn't who you were as a person exactly it it didn't really define me to be honest with you because uh, like i said i just didn't know how to well i, I didn't have the ability to uh to form you know like that it was more of a just a, a just a, a mindless act and then I enjoyed it <laughs> uh, so yeah uh, okay I lost my train of thought there for a second sorry you're saying it was like a mindless act yeah mindless was... and that's basically how I did everything when I was young mindless didn't think much about it didn't think it through you know it, so, uh, but I was in the Navy, you know, I went in the service, I was a Navy SEAL, I did a lot of training, I had a lot of, all this training and all this, uh, you could say, discipline. But that all went out the window when I got out of the Navy, it's like, I don't know what happened to it, it's like, it's like I didn't learn anything, so, you know, just started stripping really? and dancing and uh, bouncing and bars, being a bouncer and It was all not really well thought through before I did any of it. Now that I think about it, but but somehow I was pretty successful anyway. You know, I was still liked. The fans liked me. Porn, you know, for cult, that all was really great. You know, it turned out okay anyway. Somehow I can only imagine if I had the mindset now. You know, if I had the mindset then that I have now, then you know it would have been a whole different story. You know, like Zeb Atlas is a good example of that. Zeb is smart tuned in and he's still making residual money off of his videos I think you know, that's how smart he is yeah. so you went into the Navy prior to all this right the Navy before all this yeah it was before all this what? yeah okay so what inspired that Oh, well, my grandfather used to tell crazy stories about all these things that he did, which were all bogus, you know, because he had a real big ego. So he, he just filled my head full of all these crazy stories of what he did when he was in the Navy and, uh, and how much fun it was. So I thought, oh, I'd like to join the Navy. So I went in right out of high school. Boot camp in San Diego. Uh, then I did some uh, radio men. I don't know if you know what a radio man is. You know, I type messages real fast. I learned to type 100 words a minute. And then I went through the SEAL training, which was a very intense training, and I got through that. Uh, and then I got out. And uh, that was it. You know, it's like, didn't really use any of that stuff that I learned in the service much. It just kind of, it's just like the porn, you know, I just did it, you know, there was no reason for it or anything it just happened and it's like i was asleep half of my life you know now i'm awake so what made you leave the navy uh to be honest with you at that time i was uh very i get impatient really easy and bored real easy so i got bored and i had a girlfriend uh and the first time i got fucked by a guy was when i was in the navy too uh, so, oh, wow. 
that's when that was my first experience with a man sexually. And I kind of liked it. And I had hickeys on my neck, and all my friends were like, oh, Neil's got a girlfriend, you know, he's got a girlfriend. Little did I know a guy put the hickeys on my neck, of course. But um, Yeah, it's uh, it was a crazy time, you know, crazy being in the service. It was a lot of fun. But it was one of the biggest yeah. mistakes I ever made getting out. When I got out, I I got out on a dishonorable discharge. And you know, all you have to do is wet your bed. You wet your bed, they'll put you out. Really? I did it intentionally, and that's that's how they. You know, I got my dishonorable. I got my honorable discharge. So. Damn. Yep, went back home to Alabama and uh, lived there with my parents for a little while and decided to move to Atlanta after that and that's where my uh, stripping career began you know, when I first started dancing in the early 90s uh, so you just wanted to get out because you were bored you bored feel stimulated bored. it just yeah it just didn't do it for me and I just like I said I think I had limits as a child, I had certain things that happened to me that really limited me my whole life. I, I, I just couldn't really see things as they were. I, had, I didn't really know how to set boundaries, so people would just take full advantage of me. You know? and they would just run all over me. And, and I just never learned, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I was what you could say a lost boy. Lost boy. Yeah, but to be fair, don't beat yourself up too much. I was reading something or listening to something, and they were saying that if you don't look back on your life and cringe at some of the things you did and said, you're not growing. That's right. If you look back and cringe, it means you're improving. So life is all about change. It's about Yes, you have to look back and see the mistakes you made and, you know, accept them. I think acceptance is really big. You know, some people beat themselves up their whole lives about over, th over silly things. That, you know, if you just, if you just think, th think it through and work through it, and then it just sort of dissipates and goes away in a way, you know. And then you work through it and you become better. And we change. You know? yeah. Life's all about change. Nothing stays the same. So what made you go into stripping after you left the military? Because, you know, it's so common for people who leave the military to go into some type of mercenary work or law enforcement. or Exactly. Just, you know, like yeah. those types of <laughs> That's what I meant earlier. Um, gosh, I was... I was living at home in Alabama, and uh, someone said something to me. They're like, Neil, you ought to be a model or a stripper or something, because, you, know, you know, you have the look. So I, I got this idea in my head. You know, I'll move to Atlanta. My girlfriend at the time, she was a penthouse model, big tits, and worked in strip bars. So I got a job working at this place called the Lemon Pill in Atlanta and yeah they were just it was just I was basically just one of the the introductory boys I would just come out on stage at first and then the main stars would come out and do their routines and stuff and then eventually I had my own routine but I was never really that into it you know and I was very self-conscious of myself and how I looked so you know people didn't tip me I'd be like oh, why won't they tip me I just, I just, I don't know, you know, I, like I said, I just kind of went along with things, you know, and someone said something to me and I just went and did it and didn't think much about it. Uh, I guess it was fun, you know, and I made pretty good money, you could say, back then, pretty good money. All cash. <laughs> so, uh, those were the days. <laughs> So, I'm trying to think of how to word this. 
And I mean this with all due respect, but it almost seems like you were kind of sleepwalking through life. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. I was. And uh, I guess over the last few years, I've, I've had a lot of self-discovery. You know, I've learned about myself. I meditate a lot. And I was able to see sort of why I was sleepwalking through life. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's just, just reflecting back on my actions and how I was. And, and you know, uh, so it's all, it's all coming to light now. And recently my, uh, my husband, over the summer, he had a stroke. He's doing great. He's progressing and everything, but that in itself has really changed my whole perspective on life and how we take so much for granted and you know, life itself. Just being able to walk and talk and move, you know, we take it all for granted. Uh, but also compassion. You know, I, I don't think you can really experience true compassion until you've experienced true suffering real suffering, you know, pain. And that's what this has been through the summer for me. It was a rough summer. But I feel like now I have compassion for him and love and caring like I've never had for anyone. You know? So I think that's why we're here, really. We're here on this planet to learn compassion and to help others and, and just... It's not all about us, you know. It's like there are, there are other people too. It's like we can't just think about ourselves. You know, we got to look out for ourselves and set the boundaries, which I didn't do before, but but now I've learned to do that as well. So, but you know, I'm grateful he's getting better. I mean, he's on the good side of things considering what happened to him. You know, so. So. Uh... Do they know what caused the stroke? They said it was arthrosclerotic uh, vein in the head, or a vessel in the head that basically he, he thought his cholesterol levels were good, you know? They weren't good. He was being misled by his doctor somehow, you know, just didn't get the right information. He was doing all the things he needed to do, you know, except for taking a statin, you know? He wasn't taking a statin, and he should have been. Had he been taking a statin, the stroke probably would not have happened. This can happen to any of us. So I, I think it's really important that we take care of ourselves and keep check on this stuff. You know, because obviously it can happen, but, but, you know, like I said, he got misled and this all could have been avoided. But, you know, it happened. So, um. It just comes out of nowhere, you know, life, it's like, you don't ever think that anything like that can happen to you, you know, or your loved one, until it does happen, and then you know what it's like, it's like, you know, I, I've heard people talk about things they're going through, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, it's like you don't fully understand it until you've experienced it yourself, it's, 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 it's just wordless, really, there's really not a lot to say about the real experience of it all, you know? It's just it's helping me become a better person, that's all I know. And, uh, and strangely enough, this whole experience with this happening has made my body and mind more sensitive. It's made me more sexual. Like, I really, when I'm jerking off, I really get into it. It's like I used to sort of just jerk off and not you know, just get myself off. But now I can focus in on all the different pleasures that are really there. It's just, this has all made me more aware. You know, it's made my, it's made me more uh, present, more aware, more present. So therefore, sex for me now is, is incredible. You know, through this chaos that I'm going through, there are gifts that come out of it, literally. So, correct me if I'm wrong, 
But it almost like, you know, the governor in a car that only allows it to go up to a certain speed limit. It almost sounds like with your life that you had a self-imposed governor and you were basically like holding yourself back from so many things and not living up to your true potential, if you will. And then when your husband had a stroke, it all of a sudden made you realize like, holy shit. And you, you know, since removed it. Yeah. There is no governor there now. There is no limitations there now. Yeah, once you experience life, I mean, someone once said, I think it was Gloria Vanderbilt, you haven't lived until you've lived through a tragedy. It's like, that's all part of life, you know. So I wasn't able to tap into my full potential or my awareness and my presence until this happened. I, I mean, I've sort of, I've changed dramatically as a person since this happened. And I'm, gl- I'm happy for those changes. I'm glad in the way this happened. And for him as well, he needed to make certain changes and certain things, you know. So he's learning a lesson out of this as well. You know, it's a lesson. There's a lesson to be learned in these things when they happen. And I'm just going to use, sort of use this as... Uh, to perpetuate my coming back into this porn business. I'm going to just use it as like a, like, like a positive thing, you know, uh, rather than all negative and sad and depressing. But so, yeah, I think it's all going to be good. Um, life happens. Life really happens. Yeah. So, It, I don't want to say this. Like, one quote I will say that it's one of my favorite quotes, and I think it was Confucius that said it, but he said, Every man lives two lives. The second one begins when he realizes that he only has one. Yes, that's a good one. Yes. I started listening to Alan Watts a while back, you know, and I don't know if you know Alan Watts. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Eckhart Tolle, you know, these guys. They, they, they talk a lot about stuff along those lines, you know. Certain realizations. And, and through experience in life, we learn these things, I think. So, yeah. it's through the experience that you learn. The change that happens, you learn, and you realize that you you really are just a small part of the puzzle. Like we're all really in it together. We're all like the same, but different bodies. We're all connected to the yeah. same thing. And yeah, I used to feel like I was invincible. Like you know, we'll live forever. <laughs> That certainly is not the case, and that's okay. I accept that. It's just a matter of making the most of it when you have it, when you're here, you know? Yeah. So how did you and your husband meet, if you don't want me asking? Honestly, uh, he, I was living in Atlanta at the time. He was living here, uh, and I used to travel here to work as an escort, and, you know, I, I had fans, you know, I had lots of. So I would come here and book a hotel, and he just happened to be one of my clients one day. And I liked him right off the bat. He was, like, interesting and otherworldly and not like everybody else. Very, very sweet and kind and generous. And So we had a connection from the beginning. You know what I mean? And so I just started coming back to see him. He hired me, of course, the first few times, but then I just started spending time with him, and eventually he started coming to see me in Atlanta, and he was okay with the whole porn thing that I was doing. And uh, and then we thought, oh, it'd be better if you just moved to New York, you know, and get rid of the apartment in Atlanta. So we did that. I moved here with him, and that was in 2011. And we've been together 15 years. I met him in 2008. So, uh, 15 years, 
great guy. But that's how I met him. He hired me. Uh, wow. Yeah, and, I, and he was different. You know? I knew he was different. I, I'm i sorry. I, I'm just like, I'm still trying to... to... <sighs> To, to wrap my head around this, really. I mean, because you're basically like, you know, I, I think, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, I, like, when I first got into sex work, I did escorting too. And I think a lot of clients, I'm sure you experienced this too, watched Pretty Woman one too many times. Yeah. And, you know, you know the time I'm talking about. And it's like, they're all thinking that's going to play out. You literally have the very first story I have ever heard where that actually happened. Yeah. I, I'm shit. I'm blown away, <laughs> man. Fuck. Yeah. You know what? Did you mention that? I never even really thought about it, that being connected with that, but that was one of my favorite movies. You know, I love that movie. And it was also one of his favorite movies. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting, I guess. Um, a lot of people, you know, like our straight friends would ask how we met, and we would always say we met in a bar. <laughs> or whatever, you know, because, of course, I didn't tell everyone yeah. about my lifestyle and what I was doing behind the scenes, you know, to make a living or whatever. So, uh, yeah, we yeah. met in a bar. So when you were doing porn uh, the first time around, let's say you're talking to someone at the grocery store, the gym, or, you know, like out in public, and they ask what you did for a living, what would you tell them? Personal trainer, massage therapist, uh, and, and I also had friends, straight friends that knew what I did, so, you know, but, but just, if I'm just talking to someone, yeah, I, you know. I could never really be honest, you know, it was kind of a conflict sort of, it's like, because I really wanted to be honest with people and, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm a lawyer, you know, I, you know, I have this respectable job or whatever, but, you know, uh, and I, I sort of started feeling bad about it and eventually it made me start thinking, you know, more about it and everything, about my life and everything, but, uh, but I was good at hiding it from people. Unfortunately, my, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this story before. I told it to some people and it somehow a lot of people found out about it. But, you know, I was married, my wife, she, she ended up seeing one of my porn movies. And so uh, somehow Jerry Springer's office called me and says, will you be on Jerry Springer, you know, with, with your wife and you know, tell the story? And I'm like, well, let me think about it. And my wife's like, no. So I'm kind of glad she said no. Of course, I was a dumbass back then, so I, I probably would have done it anyway because I would have done just whatever without thinking about it. But it was one of those stories, you know. It was kind of a Jerry Springer story, you could say, in my life back then. So. Oh. <laughs> so you were married to a woman, and she saw one of your porn, and she was unaware of this. She was unaware that I was doing it. I was just sort of living a double life. Now, she was aware that I was escorting and seeing men. She seemed to be okay with that, so a part of me thought, well, yeah, she won't mind if I do porn. Oh, she might. Uh, she didn't like that at all. But now we're good friends, and we talk. We get along better now than we did back then, obviously. Yeah, so... Uh, how did that all play out? How did it all play out? I'm guessing... Like, I, I'm get, like, how did she find out? I'm guessing, like, one of her friends told her. She was working at a florist shop at the time, and there was a gay guy that lived there. I mean, I'm sorry, worked there, and he showed it to her. He says, is that Neil? Is that your husband? And... Yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was not pretty in the beginning, you know, when she found out that what I was doing there, it was pretty messy. I surely won't go into details, but, but yeah, I, I feel bad because, you know, I wasn't honest with her and I didn't tell her the truth. I, I, I 
it should have been. But it really put her through a lot, you know. She was she took it. It was hard on her, and uh, you know, I just really wasn't ready to be a family man. I wasn't I wasn't ready to be the the kind of family man that she wanted, you know, domestic and raise a family. You know, my daughter. That whole thing just scared me. I kind of ran away from it, and I think that's why I got into porn. Just just running away from that, you could say trying to be real and to take care of my family. I just wasn't ready for it back then, you know, so. Uh, but uh, that that's so, not me now, you know. It's like now, let's just say if I could go back, I would do the respectable thing, do the right thing, be honest, and take care of the family, and, you know. That's how it would be now. But. Yeah. So, what was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as you guys breaking up? That. Uh, the whole porn thing. She couldn't get over it, uh, basically. So, uh, I, I lived there with her for a while. And for about a year after all this happened. And it was... It was, I was... I was living in the guest bedroom, of course. I wasn't sleeping in the bed with her anymore. I was living in the guest bedroom. For about a year, and then I met a guy, and then I ended up moving to an apartment in Atlanta. And so we finally separated and got a divorce in 2005, I think. 2006. Yeah, that's when it happened. That's right around time I was really starting to come up in cult. I was, I was just, I was just excited about the whole cult thing, and you know, and I put that over over the family. You know, I did it over the family not really thinking about it but uh, anyway it's all good now I get along with them I took care of my daughter over the years I've never like missed a child you know, you know to send you know, payments for, for your child what are they called again child payments child support. child support yeah I did that never missed one so took care of her um, and you guys are close now I wouldn't say we're, we're close, but we're closer than we were. And I sometimes I'll call her if I want to talk about something. She's there. She'll talk to me and without any sort of uh, negativity or anything. So we can talk now, something we didn't really do back in the day when we were married. So, you know. Okay. All right. Um, so... You said when your husband had a stroke that it changed your perspective and it kind of made you appreciate, like you said, being able to walk and just simple things that 99.9% .9 of people take for granted. Like, what were the biggest perspective shifts other than just gratitude for the simple things? The biggest gratitude shifts hmm the biggest ones would have to be hmm Just, just enjoy life itself, and do not take anything for granted. Nothing, like every second counts. It's almost as if though, after that happened, my biggest gratitude is that I learned that we can reinvent ourselves each moment. We don't have to be the person that we've always been. If we're, if we're being present, we can constantly reinvent ourselves. And it's like we're the creators, we're the artists of our own existence. Uh, but at the same time, you realize that it's, it's out of your control. You know, there's a lot of things that's out of our control, and you have to accept that. 
So it really comes down to acceptance, too. That's a big one. Accepting things as they are. It's like I, if I find myself resisting what's happened here, or like, oh, why me? Misery comes in, pain. You know, you think about accepting what happened and fully accepting it, then it's like there's no pain. It's almost as if though we create our own misery with thoughts that we don't really need. We can think about what we want to think about. So uh, I think that's, I'm grateful for learning these things. Those are the things I'm most grateful about. You know, the, the, the deeper things inside, not just the physical walking, talking, being able to just simply move. You know, he, he lost the movement in his left arm and his left leg, but slowly they're beginning to move again. His fingers are doing more, his wrist, things that weren't happening before. So neuroplasticity is real. <laughs> you know, that's the body's ability to heal. and It's very powerful. So in this process, I'm also seeing just how powerful the human body really is. You know, beyond all these bodybuilding and working out, all this stuff that I've been doing over the years, there's so much more to the body than that, you know? Yeah, agreed 100%. So how did that inspire you to come back to porn? So I, I think I remember an interview with you that I was seeing and you're like, yeah, no, no plans to get back, come back. Yep. So obviously something changed. Yep. I know that was that cyber socket interview I did several months ago, I guess a year ago, whatever. But yeah, at that time I didn't have any intentions. You know, I was, we were settling down here, my husband and I, we were got a house up in Connecticut. That's where we're going to end up moving next month. We're going to not live in New York city anymore. So we're going to be in Connecticut, but Anyway, uh, uh, the main thing is he's a designer. He was making a lot of money, you know, and supporting us. It's my turn to support us. This is part of it is the money and the fact that I can do it fully express myself and enjoy it and get a certain pleasure out of it and he's okay with it he's the one that said why don't you go back and do that you know you have a big name you can you know daddies are in these days you know i don't it's not like i'm too old or anything to do this and i, and I feel and look great so yeah i uh there's there's a number of reasons why i'm back in it it's not just for the money of course but is to survive and to thrive on the gifts that I have. You know, I have this ass now that's just unimaginable and incomprehensible for most people. And so I'm like, why don't I use it? Really use it. You know, I like showing it off. I like pleasuring it and I like getting it pleased. And so why not make money and do it and help support my partner? He supported me for years. He changed my life. He saved my life. So now I'm basically saving his life. And this is one of the ways I'm going to do it. I like that. It's very honorable. Because a lot of people, like you said, you know, I don't think a lot of people would uh, what I'm trying to say is a lot of that times you have one person who's a primary breadwinner and then something will happen and you would hope that the other person would, you know, yeah. okay, it's my turn. Like, you know, you're doing, but I don't think a lot of people would do that. No, uh, we were living a certain lifestyle and he made a lot of money, you know, and, uh, I don't, I wasn't really making enough to actually contribute a whole lot, but you know, I was, I was, I'm really getting a good massage business going. I'm very good at it. I have a lot of clients, so, you know, I made a little money here and there, but yeah, he was the main breadwinner and then you become, you get comfortable living a certain lifestyle. Now my lifestyle that I had with that is gone. It's completely upside down. 
I would like to be more in control now, and this is one way I feel like I can control everything in my life. You know, money, security, uh, just feeling more powerful. Um, yeah. So I was like a housewife, basically, being taken care of, you know? Yeah. And he was okay with that. He, he wanted that. So, uh, but, but uh, you know, unfortunately, he made a lot of money, but we live in an expensive apartment. Most of the money he made would just go to bills. And we have a house up in Connecticut. We bought it a couple of years ago. We put all the money into that right before this happened. So it's like money is an issue right now. So, you know, this is money driven. This is sexual driven. This is for a number of things, like I said. I think that's very honorable, like I said. Um, so, you got a bunch of fan-submitted questions. Uh, one question is a great one. How have you seen the industry change since you started? Because it's changed. Oh, a fuckload. It has changed. It's a night and day difference. I mean... Yeah. What I've seen is that, you know, all these online websites just for fans, only fans, anybody can be a porn star and get famous real fast. At home, you don't have to have a studio hire you, put you on box covers, you know? So that was how it was back then, you know? See, there goes that loud noise again. Yeah. Um, can it's you not hear that me? Bad, yeah, I can hear you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would, I would be like, trying to make the cover, you know, I made several covers for Colt and that was like, you make the cover and then, you know, you're a bigger star, you know, cause people see you more and you go into DVD stores and people recognize you and they want your autograph. You know, that doesn't happen anymore because, you know, things are completely different now because, you know, DVDs aren't the thing anymore. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty drastic change. Uh, it's all internet stuff. There's so many different ways to put yourself out there, different platforms, you know, that didn't exist back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. So uh, it, there's so many tools now, you know, that, and I'm so old school still, I don't even know what half of them are, you know, it's like I'm still learning. So I'm going to, this is a learning process, trying to come back into the game, you know, when things are so different. So, uh, We'll see what happens, I guess. I, I have a lot of friends that are very tech savvy and people that are willing to help me with creating videos and setting me up with people and things like that. So it's really just a matter these days of collaborating with some of the big names, you know, and only fans and just for fans to get yourself out there and get more followers and everything yeah. like that. So uh, I, will, I will become more of an online presence. I've sort of, I'm not really... I have put a lot of energy into it, but I'm going to start doing that more. And I know that's how it's done these days. That's the difference between yeah. the old cult days and now, you know. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, ooh. Have you ever lost anyone to HIV AIDS? And if you could share their story and what you would want the world to know about them. Have I ever lost anyone? I have a, had a friend in the 90s, a client. He used to hire me you know, in the early days. His name was Neil. That's my name, Neil. He, he's the only person that personally I ever lost to, to, to AIDS. But... Uh, I talked to him. The last time I talked to him, he sounded very sick. I said, can I come see you? He's like, no, please don't come see me. So a week later I go and uh, one of the tenants says, uh, he died, he's gone. I'm like, Phew. I was like, wow, that was fast. I mean, I was just talking to him a week ago. So he must have really been late in, in that. He must have had full-blown AIDS, you know, and I didn't even know it. He hit it well. But that's, that's it, you know? It's like my partner, my husband, he took care of two guys that died of AIDS, you know? And he told me stories about it. 
So, uh, but I never had to go through that. You know, I never took care of anyone that had AIDS. And, but it's quite horrific, you know, all that stuff. To hear the stories that he's told me about. But uh, it just goes to show he's a compassionate human being as well. He did what he could for them while they were still alive. You know, and that's part of the reason why I love him and care about him he's also compassionate and caring for others but that's really all I got on that one what else you got gotcha. um, what was his biggest your biggest misconception about doing adult video and what caused that change our biggest misconception about it yeah uh, huh Just let me think on that one. I'm thinking. <laughs> it's okay. uh, I guess I thought if you become a porn star, everybody's gonna know who you are. Not everybody watches porn. So, you know, there'd be times of you know, I was a star and I'd be out and I'm like, I'm Sky Woods, and you're like, Who are you? What? <laughs> so no, I mean not everybody watches porn, and not everybody watches gay porn, especially. But I had this idea in my head, I was gonna be, everybody's gonna know me. I was gonna be very, very I was famous, but you know, it's like, I, th I was thinking at a whole different level. I was like, you know, but I realized real quick, that's not the way it is. It's definitely a misconception of it all, but. Um, that's a good one. Um, what was working with Tom Chase like, and if you have any stories? Oh, about yeah. it. Tom Chase was the most interesting character out of all the people I worked with. I mean, they were all wonderful the people I worked with, but Tom Chase was otherworldly. His energy and his presence and being were not like everybody else's. And so when I was, when we were doing our scene, he was looking into my eyes and I was feeling a connection that I didn't feel with anybody else. And he was just sexy as hell and smart. And uh, I guess the, the chemistry, like I said, is the bread and butter. You make magic. I think that was one of the best scenes I ever did for Colt. Uh, but... We, we, we sort of keep in touch now, you know, a little bit. We don't talk that much. But I didn't really talk to him ever again after that for a long time, you know, for years and years. It's almost like that day was just a magical day, and then that was it. We didn't talk much. We didn't become friends or anything. Um, but it was his uniqueness, I guess, that uh, attracted me to him and his big dick. This dick was humongous. I mean, God, why wouldn't I like that? So, <laughs> but uh, I could say, easily say he is, yeah, he's my favorite one. And he's a, he's a great guy. He's nice. He's smart. Everything about him I liked, so uh, it's, it was hard not to like him. Yeah. You know, so. Okay. Oh. Did you ever feel pressure to present as masculine in the early days of your career? I didn't hear that. If you ever felt pressure to present as masculine in the early days of your career? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the guy, the guy that run Colt, John Rutherford, he wanted me to get rid of my thong tan line because that sort of was feminine, you know, considered feminine kind of, I think. But I just loved having a thong tan line. Uh, and also my pubic hair, you know, I shaved it a certain way. I didn't like changing any of that, you know, but yeah, they were pushing me to look, try to look more manly or more like a conform to their, the way they, the models for Colt look, you know, 
I was always a little different because I had the thong tan line. I had my, my pubes were always shaved a certain way or smooth or whatever. Um, but they were okay with it because, you know, I was, I was a lot of meat, you know, and I was, I was, I was, uh, you know, they, they knew they could use me. And, and so I had the goods, but, uh, I, I'm actually a masculine person. I'm masculine. I mean, I do some feminine things, but you know, I'm masculine, but at the same time, I have a feminine side, you know, it's, a, I'm sort of half and half. Yeah. Male, female, you know. But I don't present myself as feminine, really, in front of anybody or on public or anything. You know, I'm just a normal guy, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think we all have certain feminine attributes. I think he was getting more along the lines of. Uh, like you said, that traditionally masculine cult image, if you will. But, yeah. but like I said, you know, the way I did things back then was I was sleepwalking. Now, had I listened to some of these people and done what they said, I think I probably could have taken my cult status to a whole different level. Really. I mean, I just you know, scratched the surface, really, you know. I just I was limiting myself, and I wasn't really tapping into the full potential. And as far as ma you know, the masculinity really is what it's all about with Colt, and so I feel like I probably could have taken it to another level, you know, had I listened to some of these people. But but I, like I said, I like to do things my way, and I guess that made me unique in a way. So, but I think at the same time it held me back from becoming even more of what I could have been. For, for cults, so. Yeah. Okay, someone, speaking of which, someone wanted to know how you felt about inventing the thong tan line yeah. on the muscle ass. I saw that, I read this. Uh, how did I feel about that? It was erotic for me. I don't know. Uh, I started, that thong tan line began when I was 18 years old. I started laying in a tanning bed with a thong on at 18 years old. So that thing is sort of like just ingrained into my ass. But if I feel like I had a certain power with that. Because it, it, I don't have the thong tan line right now like I did because I really haven't been tanning much. But if I were to get a thong tan line on my ass right now, it would look absolutely insane. You know what I mean? It just sort of makes the butt look even bigger. So I, I, what I knew was that the thong tan line would define my ass. It, it was different back then. You know, not a lot of guys in cold had the thong tan lines. None of them did. They just had regular, you know, just the brief tan lines. That was the thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I can say that was, that was, uh, it was, uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, having that tan line. Because you know, a lot of guys really got into it. Thong tan line, so uh, it's like a whole thing. You know, some guys are completely—it's like a fetish for them. You know? Just a tan line gets them off, you know. So I. <laughs> no, I'm 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 laughing because I I would be one of those types. I couldn't explain it. I can't articulate it. But there's something about a tan line that is so fucking. Yeah, sensitive. it is, it isn't just... it? I have no idea why. Well, I think about, I try to think about that, you know? You think about it, a, thought, a, a tan line is like wearing invisible underwear. It's almost like you, know, the, the, you see, but you don't see. So there's yeah. something erotic about that. Uh, and it feels erotic to look at it and to experience having it. And it just adds to the whole dimension of, of sex and uh, you know, like the whole nipple thing, you know, and so, sort of like that. It really is part of that, you know, I think. Uh, yeah. Adds to that dimension of sexual energy and uh, I don't know. It's, it's, 
tan line's a good thing, you know, so I'm, I'm happy I had that. And I was able to show it off for the world to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do women find, actually, I'm curious about this too. Do women find your ass attractive? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, but I really couldn't answer it because what I do get from women is a lot of stares and jealous looks. I mean, I think they, I mean, I'm serious. I will be standing in the store and I'll turn around and I will catch them. And then they'll look down, but they will have this look on their face like, what the fuck? I can see it. You know what I mean? I don't know if it, if they like it or what, but I've had women compliment me on it. But it's the looks that I get around here. I get, There's a lot of housewives that hang around here. And boy, do they stare at me and look at me in a certain way and then think it's jealousy. Honestly. Oh. But... um the most fun part is seeing the guys with their wives staring at it. You know what I mean? Um, I like that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but maybe that's why oh, the women are giving me those looks. You know what I mean? Because maybe their husbands are going after me. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's... Yeah, I, I always... I was actually talking about this yesterday with my uh, best friend. And it's like, do you ever see those couples? It'll be a straight couple. And you think, how does she not see the fact that her husband or boyfriend is gay? And it's like blatantly obvious yeah. to everyone else. Yeah. I see that a lot. And then I think, you know, relationships, sometimes it's just partnerships, you know? It's like, yeah. they're just professional partners, you know? And, uh, Sexually, they do what they want to do outside of their relationship. I'm learning more and more about these things now. You know what I mean? It's like, Professional partnership. I've never... Or, or, you know what I mean? It's no, like, it makes sense. It's like you are, you know, when you're married to someone, you're, you're partners and you're, you're basically just learning to survive and get ahead in life. And that's, that's what you use a partner for to help you. I mean, I, I talked to so many people that told me this. Uh, I didn't know anything about that, you know, years ago. I thought it was all about being married and being, you know, you, you, you can't be cheating on them. You know, you got to be, it's just you and the person. But, but it seems like these sort of relationships, being married in partnerships, a lot of them are just partnerships. Really. You know what I mean? It's so much more yeah, than I that. Know exactly. uh, So, how do you, do you identify as bisexual or gay? I used to say I was bisexual, but honestly, I, I can't even say what I am. You know what I mean? I'm not any of it. Um, no. I guess you could say I just don't like to be labeled at all anymore. <laughs> I just am what I am. Trust me, I understand. I <laughs> I'm actually the exact same way, so I get it. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you, like, when you do top, do you prefer topping men or women, and how does pussy feel different than that? <laughs> uh, well, the few men that I've topped, their asses felt nothing like a wet pussy. I mean, I, I think pussy feels... I haven't had any in so many years, I forgot it, but, oh, it was great. Uh, it, yeah, it was great. I must say, you know, I enjoyed, enjoyed it when I did it, especially with my ex-wife, you know, she was great. The wettest pussy I've ever seen and felt out of all the women I ever were with before her. But uh, I'm just not into, I'm not quite into, I think, could top a man if I was really into him and into his ass and you know I'm, I'm getting more tendencies to lean toward that a little bit but it's I'm very picky about it if I'm going to be that top for a man but honestly if I had a, a girl with an ass like mine in front of me and big boobs I would fuck the shit out of that pussy jeez 
It'd be like fucking myself with a pussy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I get it. I totally get it. Um, someone said, why did you start hiding your face on Twitter and then now you're showing it? He said, just wondering. We all know the ass from anywhere. Yeah, I, I I wanted to sort of express myself, but without showing who I really was, you know what I mean? Like I said, I had told my daughter I wouldn't do this stuff for a while, so I, I wanted to somewhat conceal my identity. But I was realizing fairly quick that people recognized my, my body and my tattoos, of course. I mean, it's like... So... Uh, the difference is my ass is, is definitely bigger, rounder, and more, it's more of a presence now than it was back then. But see, people still, they would recognize it. I, mean, like, I didn't acknowledge it. Like people say, are you Sky Woods? I wouldn't even answer the question. I mean, I'd just ignore it. But, but now I'm happy. I'm really glad I can come back and just show my face and just be there and be, be Sky Woods, you know, like I was. So... Yeah. There's a certain power in that, you know, and I feel good about it. So, uh, I, I, I like wearing the mask occasionally anyway, just because it's arousing to me to wear a mask. I don't know, the pup mask especially. Yeah, I never, that's one, I like, I'm not passing judgment, but I've never understood the appeal of that, the pup mask. I, I just, I'm like, I... Like, if I was fucking you, I want to see your face. Yeah. If I'm sitting there staring at that mask, that is like an instant boner killer. I just... You know what? I don't understand it either. It's just... Uh, it's sort of like wearing the stockings and the heels, you know. Uh, it does something for me, you know. It turns on certain sexual excitements that I don't have with just my skin, my bare skin. So, they're just like tools, you know basically, I guess, but, uh, to be honest, I prefer not to wear the mask, you know, it's just something I like to do every now and then when I do certain things uh, in the videos I do, so. Yeah, I get it. So, last question I have for you, or, no, actually, I like two more questions. First question, if you could have sex in only two positions... For the rest of your life, what would they be and why? <laughs> That's a good one. Two positions. Doggy is one of them. Because I just love being on all fours. I could stay on all fours for the rest of my life. And if somebody's fucking me on all fours forever, that would be great. Uh, and I could lie on my back with my legs spread. Get a good stretch. And you get that deep penetration. Yeah. Okay. So missionary. Yeah. Missionary. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Those are my two favorite positions. However, I'm learning new positions, different things. You know, so that may change eventually. But I can also say doggy position. It gives me a certain power. Doggy, I can really display my ass. And guys... It's now when I get doggy style in front of guys, they just get speechless. They begin to like drool and, and make funny sounds behind me. And I'm like, I really got something going. I got some power here. You know what I mean? So, so I, I guess I like that. I like being able to use it that way. So. Uh -huh. All right. And then last question is, with everything you've seen and done in your life, everything you've gone through, if you had to give one piece of advice to the people watching, what would it be? Be true to yourself. Show compassion for other people. Because it's really not all about us. You know, there's so much more in the world than just us. So I'd say just be good and be kind to other people. And because everybody has a story, everybody's got stuff going on and it's, you can't judge people. You know, I, I used to be very judgmental of people, but when you judge someone, you're limiting your own ability to understand another human being. 
You know what I mean? And then it, it's like, it, it helps you, uh, you know, think, why are you judging them? So it actually helps, it helped me to understand myself better. Now that I don't look at someone and think this or that, I just think they're a human being, you know, and they're, you know, just be kind to everybody and uh, show as much compassion as you can. You know, life is short, gotta make the most of it, and just uh, don't sleepwalk. <laughs> Like I so, for anyone who's watching this, who's not familiar with your content, where can they find you on social media, your fan sites, all that good stuff? Okay, right now I'm on Twitter at uh, the Skywoods is the Twitter name. Okay, I have a just for fans page. It's uh, Fat Booty 80 is the name of that. And I plan on changing that name to something else. I'm not sure yet, but it's at Fat Booty 80. My Just for Fans. And that's it. I'm, I'm working on creating an OnlyFans. And I'm also on Chat Chatterbay, but I don't get on that often. But I plan on getting on there more often. I'm going to probably advertise it on my platforms you know, when I get on and so on. So, uh, and I may create a website for myself, you know, skywoods.com, just a simple little website to direct people to certain links or whatever, you know, simple thing. But, yeah. Um, and I... No Instagram? I didn't hear that. You don't have any Instagram? Uh, no, not as, not as Skywoods yet. I did have one under my real name for a while. And I thought about changing that to Skywoods, but my grandmother follows that and my daughter and everybody else in my family so I don't think that's a good idea wow. so I'll, I'm gonna recreate an Instagram with Skywoods and start posting you know more like personal photos and workout stuff you know just just get back into it like that Instagram is probably like one of the better platforms to really promote yourself I think and I'm not even using it right now you know, but I will Hey guys, just want to say thank you for watching this video, and if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button, and on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord, and I personally answer that. It is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos, the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff, it is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.